Boise, Idaho, Treasure Valley, welcome to the Harvest Crusade. My name is Jonathan Laurie and I will be your host for tonight. We are going to be getting things started off right here, right now. I tell you what, we've got a great night planned for you. We have music from the Harvest Worship team. Make, a, you know, make some noise for that. Harvest Worship is going to be leading us tonight. We've got music from Jordan Feliz. Jordan Feliz, who's excited about Jordan? I am. And we've got music from Chris Tomlin. Come on, this guy has written some songs. And then we've got a great message from my dad, Pastor Greg Laurie. And I tell you what, it is going to be a really great night. And so right now, to open us up in prayer, Pastor Ben Harris. Ben, you were the guy to invite us here. You were the first email we received from a pastor in Boise, Idaho, saying, would you come and do a Harvest Crusade here? What would it take? Well, Ben... It took about three years. Yeah, exactly. It took thousands of volunteer hours and man hours. Yeah. And because of you and your prayers and the community rallying around you in this event, we are where we are today. So thank you so much, Ben. My and privilege. we've asked Ben to lead us in prayer. Thank you. My privilege. My privilege. Father God, it is good to be in the house of the Lord tonight. Father, we welcome you here and we know that you are here because your word tells us that you inhabit the praises of your people. And we've heard praises already, and there will be many more to follow. Father, we have done what we can do as men and women. We have invited you. We've done the invites to Greg to come. We have prayed and asked for favor. We have assembled your churches together, more than 100 churches represented in this room tonight, God, all for you. And Lord, while tonight we know that many, many lives will be changed, there'll be a new start, fresh beginnings for so many, Lord. I pray that this is a beginning for everyone in this room and for your church and that we would go out from here and that we would see revival start, not only here in Boise, but across the valley in Idaho and across this nation, God. Do what only you can do. Have your way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Ben Harris from River Community Church. God bless you, brother. Boise, Idaho, welcome to the 2022 Harvest Crusade.
never fails. We can trust him.
the world But it couldn't fill me You know the song, sing it out But man's empty praise And treasures that fade Are never enough And you came along, Jesus And put me back together And every desire is now satisfied right here in your love. He's here. His love is here. Come on. Let's sing it. There's nothing.
Boise, Idaho. That was Harvest Worship. How are you guys liking the evening so far? So far, so good? All right, well, we're not done yet. We've got a lot of good stuff in store for you. My dad, Pastor Greg Laurie, over the 49 years that he has been a pastor, he's written a few books. I think it's close to over 70 books now this guy has written. I have yet to write one. So yeah, big shoes to fill. 70 books, over 70 books that he has written. And I want to share with you just a little bit about his latest book. And my dad was born in the 50s, and so he grew up in what I consider one of the greatest decades ever for music, right? This was the 1960s and 70s, classic rock icons. You know, we've got Led Zeppelin, The Beatles, The Doors, Jimi Hendrix, Janis Joplin, The Beach Boys. It's like, come on, there is so much good music there. The same back then was, it was the devil's music, right? Oh, that's the devil's music. Well, the joke's on them because we know that today God can use anybody, anywhere for His glory. And we have seen so much of this music and so many of these musicians use their lives and their platforms to glorify God now. My dad's latest book, Lennon, Dylan, Alice, and Jesus, chronicles the stories of some of these people's lives who gave it all for rock and roll and ended up dying as a result either from an overdose or from some tragic situation. But there's also people that are in this book that he talks about that gave their lives to Jesus and are now a living example of what Jesus Christ can do and the Holy Spirit can do inside of a person's life when he gets a hold of them. I want to read this quick excerpt to you of what this book says. It says this, You're going to read some amazing and sometimes sad stories ahead. Some of these musicians wandered off into perilous territory, chasing one shiny thing after another, until they were in no man's land. Others were abused, victims of the foolishness of their parents, family members, or friends. And some shook their musical instruments in the face of the perfect, merciful creator of the universe and stormed off. You may not be a rock star with millions of dollars in royalties to squander on a lavish lifestyle, but with all respect, you are a lost thing, and so am I. And yet, you have a Savior, and I have a Savior, who does just as His title implies. He saves, He rescues lost things, and He restores. Amen? And my prayer, he says, is that regardless of where you are in your own story, the book that follows will be a reminder that this same God is seeking you relentlessly and lovingly. Welcome, and God bless you as he writes your story. This book is available to you tonight as you leave this evening at some of our merch tables. It is a great, uh, interesting read, I tell you what, to go through. And this is also a book that you could give maybe to a friend or family member, somebody that maybe would not darken the doorway of a church, but a book title like this, Lennon, Dylan, Alice, and Jesus, speaking of John Lennon and Bob Dylan and Alice Cooper, and of course Jesus, what do they all have in common? Well, you'll just have to read to find out. This is our book that we are offering tonight. But tonight, I'm excited to announce our next artist. Are you guys excited? You're like, who is it? Our next artist is a Dove award-winning contemporary Christian pop singer and songwriter whose music walks between classic rock, one of my favorites, some good retro 70s R&B, and modern pop. Born in Clovis, California, Jordan Feliz is now living in Nashville with his wife and children. His music career started in 2006, but it was his solo career that broke out in the Christian music scene in 2015 with his debut album, Beloved. And most recently, Jordan has released several other albums featuring multiple chart toppers under Centricity Music. Boise, Idaho, would you give a warm Treasure Valley welcome to our artist right now, Jordan Feliz. Go away. 
say it enough, but we're going to close our portion of this night out with a hope and a truth that we believe that Jesus is coming back and taking us home. Amen. Harvest Crusade, can I get an Have you ever thought that the world has kind of lost its way? Mm -hmm. Crazy as it seems, I know it's gonna be okay. Ooh, yeah. It doesn't scare me, it's temporary. There's something better we got forever. And it won't be long, cause we know our help is on the way. The way. So keep your head up.
ladies and gentlemen, Jordan Feliz. Come on. Thank you, guys. All right. Well, you guys can go ahead and have a seat. Again, I'm Jonathan Laurie. I'm your host for this evening. And I tell you what, you are going to be in for a treat when we hear from our next artist, Chris Tomlin. Yes, Chris is going to be playing. But before we do that, I want to share a little bit about an opportunity that we all have here together to invest in changed lives. What is the value of a soul? What is the value of a changed life? If we could put a dollar amount on that, um, I think the number would be astronomical. But here at Harvest, we believe in the mission statement of knowing God and making Him known. That is who we are as a ministry, knowing God and making Him known. And we love to proclaim the gospel anywhere and any, uh, everywhere we receive an invitation. And tonight, as we mentioned earlier, we were invited by a local pastor. And then it set the groundwork into place and now we are seeing thousands of lives being changed by the gospel. People uh, coming to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior, hearing about Jesus for the very first time. And it's because of you and because of your participation and the local community here in Boise. Over the years, Harvest as a ministry, we have seen 6 million people in live attendance at our Harvest Crusades hear the gospel in a personal and direct way over the course of the 30 years that we've been doing our events. 600,000 people have made a profession to follow Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior over those 32 years. Absolutely amazing. And now you might think, wow, that's a, that's a really big number. Do any of these stick? You know what, that's between them and the Lord. We do what we are called to do. We, uh, my dad is, has the gift of an evangelist to proclaim the gospel in a clear and understandable and relatable way. And so as we do that, we trust the results up to God. In Scripture, we are told, the Apostle Paul, he said, I planted the seed, Apollos watered the seed, but God brought the increase. We trust the Lord with those results and what he is going to do. And tonight, I do want to share a story with you of one such individual who was tremendously Tremendously impacted by the gospel. Ironically, this was a man that was on our staff and it was his very uncle that was impacted by the gospel. We've got a video that we want to share with you tonight. So turn your attention to the screen. My name is uh, Don Billets and I'm an outreach pastor here at Harvest. A uh, call came in to me from a gal named Nancy Bailey, and she said, I've been invited to sit in the guest seating section. And I said, how many seats would you like? And she said, well, originally I was going to ask for two. But looking at your last name, it's not a last name that you hear every day, Billets. She said, so I walked two doors down to Fred Billets. And I held up your card and said, uh, Freddie, do you know this gentleman? And he looked at the card and said, yes, I, I know him. He's my nephew and he works for that church. She said, so instead of asking for two seats, I'm going to ask for four because I'm going to invite your Uncle Freddie and your Aunt Mary to come to the crusade. I didn't really have the heart to tell her, well, I've been doing that for three decades and he's probably not going to come. So the next day, uh, I get an email from Nancy and, and first thing I see when I open up the email is just nothing but exclamation points. And she said, praise the Lord, Uncle Freddie has accepted our invitation to come to the crusade. So they came to the crusade for King and Country was performing and they were pretty loud. Uncle Freddie put some earplugs in, but I was really encouraged to see him remove those earplugs when Pastor Greg started sharing the message. But when Pastor Greg gave the invitation, Uncle Freddie, he wasn't moving. And I went and knelt down by Uncle Freddie and I said, Uncle Freddie, I got a question for you. Have you ever asked God to be part of your life? And he said, no, I never have. You might not know this, but your brother my daddy accepted Christ six months before he died. I know where my father is. And Freddie, I sure would like to know that you are going to be with us as well. If you need some moral support, I'd be more than glad to walk down on that field with you. And he looked at me with a, a kind of an amused look, turned to his wife and said, I'm going down there with him. I had the privilege of walking forward with my 79-year-old Uncle Freddie. And as we were down on the field, he was in a very reverent pose, head bowed, hands clasped in front of him. And I had my hand on his shoulder and I was in an attitude of prayer. But whenever I felt him move, I opened up my eyes and standing there next to me, he had, he had his hands raised in prayer and 
tears streaming down his eyes. And uh, at that moment in time, I had tears streaming down my eyes as well. As we made our way back up to them, Aunt Mary sees us. She rushes to Uncle Freddie. She wraps her arms around him, and she's looking at me over his shoulder. She's hugging him, and she's just bawling. And she said, praise God. Freddie, you are living proof. And he said, of what? And she said that they will let anybody into heaven. Everybody just, just cracked up. And he said, I should have done this a long time ago. Uh, my Uncle Freddie lived, I believe, less than a year after that. We serve a God that never gives up on us. Keep praying, keep inviting, keep bringing people. Who knows? Could be your Uncle Freddie. How great is that? Don's on our staff back home in California as a pastor, and Don's here tonight somewhere in the building. And uh, we're so thankful for stories like Uncle Freddie. I think we all have an Uncle Freddie in our lives, somebody that we believe is maybe even beyond the reach of God. Is that possible? Listen, nobody is beyond the reach of God. And we're thankful for Chuck and Nancy who so faithfully invited Don's neighbor, or their neighbor, Don's uncle, Uncle Freddie. And so tonight, again, we just want to invite you to participate with us now financially to help us do what God has called us to do and what God has enabled us to do through the uh, proclamation of the gospel. And so wherever you're seated tonight, in the cup holder, if you would, there's a little uh, an envelope right there. And if you want to pull that envelope out, there's some information there. It should look like this one here. It should look like this, uh, this envelope right here. And if you want to look at that, it actually tells you uh, all the different ways that you can give. You can go ahead and uh, fill out your information if you'd like. There's also on this card, as well as on the screens right now, a QR code that you can uh, uh, go to on your phone. It's going to take you to a website that's really simple. And you can enter your information. You can do a one-time gift um, just to help us offset the cost of this event here tonight so that we can make it happen. And so uh, we also want to let you know that because of your generosity, we also want to send you the book that I was talking about earlier, uh, Lennon, Dylan, Alice, and Jesus, uh, for your gift of any size. And so this is um, just a resource we want to get into your hands. And so however you choose to give tonight, whether it's digitally, go to the website. I, I prefer to do it that way. I like to do things on my phone. Uh, or if you'd like to write down your information and drop it in the offering bucket as the ushers pass those by, you're welcome to do that as well. But we just want to let you know it's because of you. It's because of your partnership. It's because of your faithfulness of the community here in Boise that we are here today. And so we want to make sure that we, uh, we have more opportunities in the future to share the gospel wherever we go. We do events, we've done events all over the world, and we do things online and all kinds of things that we just love to proclaim the gospel. And so help us to offset the cost of this event here tonight by your gift of any size. And now the Harvest Worship Team is going to lead us in a song. And uh, I would just invite you to all join me in prayer as we continue in worship this evening. Heavenly Father, we commit the rest of this night to you now. We thank you, Lord, for the generosity that you have shown to us. You sent your son Jesus to die on the cross for us when we didn't deserve it. Lord, there's nothing that we could do to earn eternal life. So you knew that you had to send your son Jesus on a rescue mission. And it's because of that generosity that so many of us are here tonight and we are evidence of a changed life. We're evidence of the Holy Spirit. And so, Lord, we trust that that is going to take place tonight. So we now give in advance knowing that you are going to do a work, knowing that you're going to do something amazing here in the Treasure Valley. In 2022, lives are going to be changed. And so, Lord, we love you. We ask that you would bless this time of giving. In Jesus' name we pray together. Amen.
Hello, Boise. Good to see you all tonight. Hey, you can all be seated. So great to be back here for the second night. Last night was so amazing with so many folks coming down on this floor, making a commitment to follow Jesus Christ. Over 1,600 of them came down. That was just incredible. So, so. How many of you were here last night? Raise your hand up. You were here last night? Ah, repeat offenders, good. How many of you are here for the first time tonight? Raise your hand up. Lots of you, lots of you, great. Well, I said this last night, I'll say it again. People, I'm here to evangelize all the Californians that have invaded your state. 
What do you think? And then I'm going then I'm gonna take him back to California with me. I don't know if they know that guy. Yeah. The the Californians are not clapping. Um, so what a what a great place you live. Uh, we went to the zoo today, the Boise Zoo. I think it's called Zoo Boise. And uh, there was this really cool little exhibit of these monkeys, and they, they're, they're communicating with each other and swinging back and forth. And it reminded me of a story of a guy that was desperate for work, and he heard they were hiring down at the local zoo. Maybe it was this zoo. I don't know. So he went down and applied, and the guy in charge said, sorry, sir, there's no openings right now. Then looking at this man who was very large, uh, the zookeeper said, okay, I don't want you to be offended by this, but our gorilla died the other day, and we've ordered a new one. He's on his way. Would you be willing, if we made you a custom gorilla suit, to put it on and pretend to be the gorilla until the real one arrives? And then he told the man how much he would pay. The guy said, I'm in. So they put him in the gorilla suit. He felt very self-conscious. He thought no one's going to believe it. And he went into the cage and a big crowd formed and the people were excited and so he moved around a little. By the second day, he's swinging back and forth. He's pounding his chest, having a great time. And he got a little too excited as he was swinging and swung right out of the gorilla cage into the lion's cage. <laughs> now he had a dilemma. If he cries out for help, everyone will know he's a fraud. And the lion's approaching quickly. And finally, the guy in the gorilla suit can't contain it any longer, and he says, help! And the lion says, shut up or you'll get us both fired. <laughs> you know, there are people running around today, they, they say, I, I'm a Christian. I have a relationship with God, but they don't. You know, the Bible says, check up on yourself. Are you really a Christian, or are you just pretending to be a Christian when you aren't at all? You know, religion cannot save you. Going to church cannot save you. Doing things out of obedience even to how you think God wants you to behave won't save you. Only Jesus Christ can save you, okay? Only Jesus. So I'm going to talk about that in a few moments of my message. That will be titled, Do Not Be Afraid. But before that, we have really someone that doesn't need an introduction. But in case you don't know who I'm talking about, Chris Tomlin, he was born and raised in Texas. He sold more than 8 million albums. He has 11.3 million digital tracks, 16 number one singles, BMI Songwriter of the Year Award, and more. It just goes on and on, three Billboard Music Awards. So I said, Chris, you know, what would you like me to say about you tonight? Chris Tomlin said, just tell them I'm here to lead them in worship. So let's worship now with Chris Tomlin.
gonna sing this together. The world's so full of fear these days, but that's not our story. Our story is faith in the midst of fear. Whatever comes our way, let this, so can we rise up in faith and sing this in faith, these words. I know who calls me. is where have I been? This place, this is incredible tonight. I just, the spirit of this place, the energy of this place. I would just, if it's okay, I would just love to uh, nominate ourselves to be the official worship band of Idaho, if that's okay tonight. This is, uh,
sing this last verse and we sing my chains are gone we get to that moment again just let it come from a grateful heart worship comes from a thankful heart and we've got a lot to be grateful for tonight in this place tonight where would any of us be without the grace of God this is the good news this is the reason that we have a hope tonight this is the reason we have a song tonight because of what Jesus has done all of us have a story of, of God breaking those chains. And so when we sing that, let's sing it in freedom. People who know what it is to sing in freedom tonight of God breaking those chains. So let it come from that place. The earth shall soon dissolve the sun Fantastic. How many, how many of you would like to hear some more songs from Chris Tomlin? <laughs> Me too. And he's gonna be back in a few minutes to do a post-concert for all of you. So he's gonna do some more songs. Isn't that great?
Hey, if you brought a Bible, you can turn to John 14. And the title of my message is, Don't Be Afraid. Let's pray together. Father, as we sit here in this comfortable place, we think of the people of Ukraine right now and all that they're going through. So many have lost their lives. So many are running for their lives. Lord, put your hand on them. Protect these people. Bring an end to these hostilities, we would pray. And Lord, I pray for every person in this room and every person that is watching. There are many that are so frightened, so alarmed, so scared, so freaked out. And yet Jesus has said, do not be afraid. So speak to us from your word, we pray now. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so we're living in crazy times right now. Just when you thought it could not get any worse, it did. I mean, we're coming through the worst pandemic in modern history, and now it seems like the world is on fire. We see this blistering attack by Russia under President Putin on Ukraine. It's a powder keg that literally threatens the whole world, and now uh, Russia has even threatened to use chemical and biological weapons and even nuclear weapons. In fact, uh, President Putin of Russia recently boasted they've developed a brand new missile that can fire 12 nuclear warheads at once, and they fittingly call it the Satan missile. I just read this today. And this is scary. I mean, we haven't heard talk of a potential nuclear conflict in a long time. I remember hearing it when I was a kid in elementary school in the 60s. And they told us, if there is a nuclear blast, everybody get under your desk. Th that would have done a lot of good, right? I'm, I'm, it's okay, I'm under my desk. This will protect me for sure. So with all that's going on in our world, <clears throat> we have a lot of people afraid in America. Many are filled with stress and anxiety, which is understandable. We have COVID, we have inflation, we have this conflict that's happening in Ukraine, and something is new that psychologists have coined a phrase for, they call it doomsday anxiety. Doomsday anxiety. It includes the fear or worry about the end of the world or life as we know it. It involves symptoms like chronic nightmares, an underlying feeling of fear, and an obsession with the news as they doom scroll through the online post. Doom scrolling is what they call it right now. So how are we reacting? Well, in America, a lot of kids are just on spring break. They're partying away. Crime is up. Shootings are up. Last week, and ironically, when we celebrated Christ rising, instead we see crime rising. And we see people partying like there's nothing to worry about. I think they're taking the advice of Prince, party like it's 1999. No folks, don't party like it's 1999. Pray like it's 2022. We need God's help. <laughs> I wonder if I'm talking to somebody right now that is stressed out to the max. It seems like what could not go wrong just went wrong. When it couldn't get any worse, it actually got worse. Let me ask you the question, do you have kids? Let me rephrase the question. Do you have teenagers? Then you know what I'm talking about, right? And now we have these little devices. We all carry the cell phone, right? And this only adds to the stress. This only adds to the anxiety. I remember when cell phones first came out, I was so excited. They were about the size of a World War II walkie-talkie. It was fittingly called the brick made by Motorola. It had a battery life of like nine minutes. And uh, you carried them around, you thought you're so high tech, I've got my cell phone. Then they got smaller and smaller. And now in many ways they control our lives. And uh, so I have a way for you to get rid of your stress tonight. Are you ready? Pull out your cell phone, pull it out. We're gonna get rid of your stress. Put it on the ground, stomp on it. No, don't, don't. I did however drop my phone in the toilet yesterday. It was a clean toilet, if a toilet can be clean, but still, that was not, it wasn't this phone, but you know, so, but a lot of stress comes from this little device that we carry around in our pocket. Let's do something good with it right now. Take out your cell phone, and I want you to shoot a text out to somebody, and just say, 
Go to harvest.org right now for a message that can change your life. You can text it, hashtag Boise Harvest. A message that could change your life. Is that really true? You might say, Greg, who do you think you are with this so-called message that can change someone's life? It's not my message. It's God's message. I'm just sharing it with you. It doesn't originate with me. It's the message that the Bible calls the gospel. When I was a kid, I was a newspaper boy. So I rode around in my super cool Schwinn Stingray. And by the way, I had a stick shift on it. They don't make those anymore because they were unsafe. But still, I'd ride around. I got pretty good at throwing those papers. The sideways throw, over the hedge throw, underhanded throw, get it up on the porch. My job was not to make the news. My job was not to write the news. My job was to deliver the news. And my job has not changed. I'm here to deliver the good news of Jesus Christ to you right now. And yes, it can change your life. I remember the story of a man named Earl. This is years ago when we were doing one of our crusades in Albuquerque, New Mexico. We were in a venue that was called The Pit, of all things. And so this guy, Earl, uh, was born in Turkey. He was a Muslim. He came to America, pretty much abandoned his roots and married some American girl. They got divorced. He got heavily into drugs. And one night he decided he was going to take his own life. He went down to the bank. He emptied his bank account, had all of that money, and he was going to buy as much cocaine as he could and overdose on it. As he was on his way to the destination, his drug dealer, he was looking for some dark, creepy music to listen to, and he comes across a Christian radio station. And they're playing a Christian song. And the announcer said, and that band is playing tonight at the pit, at the Harvest Crusade. He looks out his window and he's literally driving by the pit at that very moment. So Earl pulls into the parking lot, gets out of his car, walks into the arena, very similar, similar to this one, takes his seat, listens to the music, hears me preach the gospel. He got up and gave his life to Jesus Christ. And his life was changed forever. He's serving, he's serving the Lord today in Chicago. He's actually on a church staff. God can change your life. I don't know what motive brought you here. I don't know why you're here, but I know there's power in this message. Let me read you now the words of Jesus from 2,000 years ago, but they ring so true for all of us. John chapter 14, Jesus says, let not your heart be troubled, you believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, you may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way you know. Thomas said, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes of the Father except through me. It's right here in the front of the stage, isn't it? Let's all say this together. I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father except through me. That's it. Now here's the first thing Jesus says. If you're troubled, the word that he uses here, let not your heart be troubled, means don't let your heart shudder. If you're filled with anxiety because of doomsday scrolling, if you're filled with fear right now, if your heart is shuddering, here's the first thing Jesus says. His cure for heart trouble, if you will. Number one, believe what God says in his word. Believe what God says in his word. Do you believe in God? You know, <laughs> you're very responsive people here, I tell you. Now you can know about God and not know God. You know, you can have things you've learned about God but have no relationship with God. Some years ago I was in a mental institution, not as a patient, I was visiting. And um, I was with a friend of mine and I had really long hair and a beard at that point. And so some people said I looked a little bit like Jesus, right? So I, I walked into this mental institution and my friend, there I am. So my friend said to this patient, have you ever met Jesus Christ personally? And the guy turned to me, grabbed my hand and shook it and said, Jesus, good to meet you. <laughs> I said, I'm not Jesus, buddy. I, I'm just Greg. 
But, uh, but have you met Jesus Christ personally? I ask you that now. Do you believe in him? Listen, everyone believes in something. Some people believe in themselves. Other believe, others believe in money. Others believe in government. God help you. Um, yeah. Some believe in technology. Oh, technology is going to answer all of our questions. It's going to solve all of our problems. But when that day comes, that final day of your life, none of those things will save you. The author of a biography about Steve Jobs remembered a conversation he had with Steve. He says, I was sitting in the backyard with Steve and the subject of God came up. Steve Jobs said, and I quote, Sometimes I believe in God, sometimes I don't. I think it's 50-50 maybe. Ever since I've had cancer, I've been thinking about it more, but I find myself believing a bit more. Steve Jobs says, I want to believe in an afterlife that when you die, you don't just disappear. Then he paused for a second and he said, yeah, but sometimes I think it's like an on and off switch. Click and you're gone, he said and paused and then he said, and that's why I don't like putting on off switches on Apple devices, end quote. Kind of a scary thought. Click and you're gone. Before I was a Christian when I was just a kid, that's what I thought. I thought one day I'll just cease to exist. But then I thought how can I no longer exist? How can I no longer be me? And I was terrified of death. Are you afraid of death right now? But I can tell you I'm much older a lot older, and I'm no longer afraid to die because I have hope of life beyond the grave, you see, because of what Jesus said. Jesus says, do not be afraid. I am the living one. I died, but look, I'm alive forevermore. I hold the keys to death in the grave. He says, don't be afraid. By the way, I'm glad Jesus has the keys because if I had the keys, they would have been lost by now. <laughs> I'm always losing my keys and my wallet and other things as well. Now I'm not saying I look forward to death, but I look forward to going to heaven because I have this hope that's been given to me by Christ who said, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live, and whosoever lives and believes in me shall never die. And I'll tell you what, as you get older, time passes so quickly. I mean, my life is just flashing before me. I mean, I was born in the 50s. I lived through the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s. I have Sirius XM radio, and I see 60s on 6, 70s on 7. And I go through these things that, that these are decades of my life that I actually lived. And now my generation, the baby boomers, we love to sing the anthem forever young. Not anymore. <laughs> We've gone from acid rock to acid reflux. The Rolling Stones are still touring, I see. And Mick and Keith are singing, Time is Still on My Side. Have you looked at Mick and Keith lately? I, guys, I don't think time is on your side. The Who is still out there playing? Instead of playing that song, talking about my generation, they've updated it too, talking about my medication. <laughs> These are the jokes, people. Okay. Ringo Starr from the Beatles had the hit. Uh, a little help from my friends. Now he's updated it to a little help from Depend. So, you know. <laughs> but you know, there are signs you're getting older. You know you're getting older when you shop at Forever 21 when you're 66. You just need to <laughs> stop doing that. You know you're getting old when you sink your teeth into a juicy steak and they stay there. You know you're getting old when you're pulling up your socks because there's wrinkles and you realize, oh no, I'm not wearing socks. <laughs> you know you're getting old when you drop something on the ground and you reach down to get it and you wonder what else you can do while you're down there, right? <laughs> Is that resonating with someone out there? <laughs> so people are in denial. Well, I'll have some surgery done. You pull this, you nip that, you tuck, you inject other things. You, you have so much Botox in your face, we don't even know what you're thinking anymore. We don't know if you're mad, if you're happy. We just know you look perpetually surprised. <laughs> right? Listen, you can get all the potions and the lotions and eat all of the kale and the tofu. 
you're not gonna extend your life one single day because uh, God determines how long you will live. I did read about a 105 year old woman from Texas who had seven children. Her name was Pearl Cantrell. She was asked, what is the secret to your long life? Her answer was simple. She says, I love bacon, I eat it every day. Go figure, bacon. I like her. Speaking of that, I was talking to my granddaughter Allie a while back and um, she said, Papa, that's what she calls me, I'm a vegan now, while she was eating bacon. <laughs> said, honey, you cannot be a vegan and be eating bacon. And she says, well, I can't help it. I just like meat from a pig. Yeah, I, I understand. She'll probably live to be 105 years old as well. Listen, life's gonna have a beginning, it's gonna have a middle, it's gonna be, have an end. But listen to this, death died when Christ rose. You say, Greg, are you delusional? You don't think you're gonna die? Oh, I know my body will go into the ground, but my soul will live on. My soul is eternal. Then I enter the afterlife, and I determine in this life where I will spend the afterlife. And let me just give you a hint of what's coming. You have two choices, heaven or hell. Another way to put it, smoking and non-smoking. Okay, so it's up to you. But it's no joke. It's real. You make that decision here. I read about a man that was walking through a cemetery, and he saw an inscription on a tombstone that said, Pause now, stranger, as you pass by. As you are now, so once was I. As I am now, so you shall be. So prepare for death and follow me. After reading that, the man was overheard to say, to follow you is not my intent until I know which way you went. <laughs> so which way are you gonna go? You say, well, heaven, because I'm a good person. Are you? Are you really a good person? And to the point, being a good person will not get you to heaven. Heaven is not for good people. Heaven is for forgiven people. You see? But I think about heaven quite a bit because 14 years ago an unspeakable tragedy happened in our home. Our oldest son Christopher was unexpectedly called home to heaven. He died in an automobile accident. When I heard that news that my son had died I felt like time stood still, that all the air went out of the room and I literally thought I could die. Uh, not from taking my life, but just if words could kill you, I felt like those words could kill me. But here's the hope that I have. I still miss him. I, I still grieve over losing him. But on the other hand, I know I will see him again in heaven because of Jesus Christ. Not because he was my son, but because he believed in God's son who forgave him of all of his sins just as he forgives each of us if we put our faith in Christ. Maybe I'm talking to someone who has had a loved one die recently. Or if you received bad news from a doctor. Or your marriage is falling apart. Or your parents are divorcing. Or too many Californians have moved into your state and are driving prices up. I don't know. <laughs> but you find yourself helpless and hopeless. But I'm saying you don't give up hope. It's been said man can live 40 days without food, three days without water, eight minutes without air, but only one second without hope. Have you lost hope tonight? Don't lose it because Christ is here. Help is on the way. Hope is on the way in a relationship with him. Believe in God. The second reason your heart should not be troubled or agitated, according to Jesus, is because if you're a Christian, you're going to heaven. He said, in my Father's house are many mansions. Listen to this, heaven is a real place for real people to do real things. Now the problem is, Hollywood has sort of caricatured heaven and we think it's this really strange place where we sit around on clouds and pluck harps and little fat babies with wings hover around us and that's not heaven. Think of the most beautiful thing, thing you've ever seen. Think of the beauty all around you here in this state that you live in. 
That's just a glimpse of greater things to come. Heaven is not the watered down version. Heaven is the real version. Here on earth we just see sort of the imitation of greater things to come that God has for every follower of Jesus Christ who have believed in Him. That's why we need to look to the Lord. But the non-believer does not have the promise of heaven. I heard the story of a Christian father who was dying. So he gathered his three sons by his bedside. And to two of the sons he said, goodbye sons, I'll see you in the morning. And uh, the third son said, dad, why did you say that to them? What are you gonna say to me? He's just said, goodbye son. Wait, wait goodbye son, I, why can't I see you in the morning? The father said, because your brothers have put their faith in Christ, so we'll be reunited in heaven, in the afterlife. He said, but dad, I want to see you in the afterlife too. He said, son, then you need to believe in Jesus, and you will. And that boy believed in Jesus at that very moment. And we need to do the same. You see? When Jesus says, in my father's house are many mansions, I don't know if he's talking about actual buildings. I did hear about a minister and a New York cab driver who died on the same day. They went through the pearly gates and Simon Peter met them of course and said to uh, the cab driver, okay, uh, that's your mansion right over there. You gone over there now and enjoyed it. It was a huge palatial mansion. The cab driver was very excited and went to his mansion. The minister was watching thinking, wow, he's a cab driver and he gets a mansion? Think about what I have. I'm a minister. I've helped people. I've pointed people to God. Peter says, okay, hey, there's your little shack there in the valley. Go to your little shack. He says, wait, why do I get a shack when a New York cab driver gets a mansion? Peter said, because when you preached, people slept. When he drove, people prayed. See, so it's... <laughs> so I don't know if these are actual mansions. They could be. Again, heaven is a real place for real people to do real things. Maybe it's referring to our new body. God's going to give you a new body. People ask, well, what will that body be like? Well, it will be better than the body you have right now. It will be the radically upgraded version of you. So if you're looking for me in heaven, look for someone with probably an afro or something, you know. <laughs> then again, maybe we'll all be bald in heaven. Have you ever thought about that? Yeah, that's not a very good thought, is it? I was talking to two of my granddaughters, Stella and Lucy. They said, Papa, how old will we be when we get to heaven? I said, girls, I don't know. Maybe 33. They said, why 33? I said, well, that was the age Jesus was when he died. Then Lucy, uh, my granddaughter, said, I want to be three when I'm in heaven. I said, three? Why do you want to be three? She said, I miss the old me. Well, this body we're in right now is breaking down. Experts tell us as we get older, the number of nerve cells in the brain decrease. We start with around 100 billion brain cells, but then in our 20s, the number starts to decline. At 40, we're losing up to 10,000 brain cells a day. You've probably lost 5,000 brain cells listening to me tonight. But there's a hope of another body, a newer body. So if you were disabled on earth, you won't be in heaven. If your body has cancer here, it won't be then. If your body's worn out here, it won't be then. So let not your heart be troubled. It's good news. Why? Believe God's word. Believe what God says in his word. Number two, you're going to heaven if you're a Christian. And number three, he's shown us the way to heaven. I was told that this arena we're in right now, the Extra Mile Arena, the first person here was not a sports team or a rock band or anybody else. It was Billy Graham who did an eight-night crusade. Isn't that great? I got to know Billy Graham quite well. In fact, I wrote a book about it called Billy Graham, The Man I Knew, A Man I Knew. And he was a wonderful man, a godly man. I heard the story of when Billy was in a town to do one of his crusades. He wrote a letter to his wife Ruth, but he didn't know where the post office was. So he was walking around looking for it. 
and uh, he saw some young man there and he said, young man, can you tell me where the post office is? The little guy said, yeah, just go up the street here, turn right, and that's the post office. He goes, that's great. By the way, he said, I'm speaking here in the stadium tonight and maybe you would like to come and hear me and I will show you how to get to heaven. The little guy said, why should I go hear you? You don't even know the way to the post office. <laughs> how do you get to heaven? How can you know you'll go to heaven when you die? Jesus gives us the answer. He says, where I go and the way you know. And I love how Thomas said, we don't know where you're going and we don't know the way. I think a lot of times when Jesus spoke to his disciples, it went right over their heads. He talked about dying and rising from the dead. They just didn't understand that at all. And when he would talk about things like that, they would probably nod their heads in unison. Oh, that's so deep. They were clueless. It's like a teacher in a class doing some complex equation up on the math board or up on the blackboard and they say, do you all understand it? Everyone's yes, but no one understands. So Jesus says, where I go you know and the way you know. Thomas says, we don't know what you're talking about. We don't know the way and we do not know where you're going. But I'm glad Jesus asked that, or I'm glad Thomas asked that question because Jesus then said, I am the way, the truth, and the life and no man comes to the Father but by me. You know, Thomas has been described as, described as a doubter. We call him Doubting Thomas. He was more of a skeptic. He didn't let other people make his decisions for him. When I became a Christian at the age of 17, I was a skeptic. I lived a hard life. My, married, my mother was married and divorced seven times. She was a raging alcoholic. All I saw was bad behavior of adults fighting and passing out at night. And uh, so I tried drinking for a while and was disillusioned with it. I got into drugs for a while. And by the age of 17, I felt like I was 70. And I was wondering, what is life all about? I don't see any adult that I know that I want to be like. And, and these kids that I hang around with, they don't know any more than I know. And I was searching and I transferred over to this high school called Harbor High School in Newport Beach, California. And uh, there was a lot, of, a lot of Christians there because the Jesus movement was in full swing. And one of my friends warned me, Greg, stay away from the Jesus freaks. And I said, the last thing Greg Laurie will ever do is become a Jesus freak. <laughs> yeah, famous last words. I thought they were a little nutty. I thought they were a little weird. I thought, where do these people come from? I thought they were like, you know, one taco short of a combination plate maybe. <laughs> but one day I went across the campus and there was a group of Christians sitting there singing their songs about God. And I sat close enough to hear what they were saying, but not so close that my friends would think I was becoming a Christian. And that was the first time I heard this evangelist named Lonnie speak, and he said, Jesus said, you're for me or against me. And I looked around at the Christians and I thought, well, I'm not one of them. Does that mean I'm against Jesus? I don't want to be against Jesus. I've always acknowledged he existed. I've always sort of believed in him or what I knew of him. I'd seen all of his movies. But it was the first time that the idea of having a relationship with God was presented to me. And Lonnie gave this invitation for people to come to Christ. And kids got up and walked forward. On a high school campus, I thought, there's no way I would ever do that. I sort of hung my head down. My hair was hanging in my eyes. Use your imagination. Um, <laughs> next thing I knew, I was up there praying. And that was the day Christ came into my life. And I have never regretted making that decision. And I'm going to ask you to make a similar decision tonight. Maybe you came here as a skeptic. Someone that wasn't sure if this was all true. Maybe your friend bribed you with food afterwards. I don't know what. But you're here. And I want you to think for yourself. Be like Thomas, be a skeptic, say, yeah, well, I'm not sure. I'm not gonna let somebody else think for me. We engage in sort of group think. What is popular? What is cool? What is the trend? Think for yourself. Because I believe God is speaking to some people's hearts right now. And this is what you've been looking for. Not religion, 
Not a bunch of rules and regulations, a relationship with God that you can have. Just like the 1,600 people that came down on this floor last night and prayed that prayer, committing their life to Jesus, the same thing can happen for you tonight. It's true. But what do you need to do? Number one, you need to admit you're a sinner. The Bible says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Every one of us have sinned. A sin means to cross a line. That's one definition of it, to cross a line. God has given us the Ten Commandments. You shall not steal. You shall not lie. You shall not take the Lord's name in vain. On the list goes. We've broken those commandments. Some of us have broken all of the commandments. And yet the Bible says if you offend in one point of the law, you're guilty of all of it. So don't tell me you're a good person and you don't need God. You've broken those commandments. And the Bible says the soul that sins will surely die. So we're all separated from God by our sin. Good works won't help you get to God. Going to church won't help you get to God. Start by admitting you're a sinner. Then number two, recognize that Christ died on the cross for you. Why did he suffer and die 2,000 years ago? Why did he let them whip him with that most likely cat of nine tails tearing into his back, into his skeletal tissue? Why did he let them nail him to a cross because he died for your sins? Only Jesus is qualified to bridge the gap between a holy God and sinful humanity. With one hand he took hold of God, with the other hand he took hold of humanity, and they put spikes to those hands, and it was not nails that held Jesus to the cross, it was love for you. God loves you. <laughs> Jesus put it best when he said, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, and whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Then thirdly, you need to repent of your sin. You say, well, I don't even know what that means. I don't think I've even pented. How do I repent? <laughs> well, repent means to change your direction. It's a military term. So I was going this way, I, I repent, I turn around and I'm going this way. So you let go of that old sin. You turn your back on that old life and you take hold of Jesus Christ. The Bible says God has commanded everyone to repent and times of refreshment will come from the presence of the Lord. And then you must receive Christ into your life. Jesus says, behold, I stand at the door and I knock. If any man will hear my voice and open the door, I will come in. Only you can say, Jesus, come into my life. Forgive me of my sin. Are you certain right now that Christ is living in your life? If you would say, well, I'm not sure, then I would tend to think maybe he isn't. I mean, if someone moved into your house into the middle of the night and they were cooking fish in your kitchen, do you think you would know? I'm not suggesting Jesus is doing that, but my point is, if God Almighty, the creator of the universe, has taken residence in your heart, you will know. And if you don't know, maybe he's not there yet. Maybe you need to say, Jesus, come into my life and forgive me of my sin. And then you need to do it publicly. That's why I'm gonna ask you to do what so many did last night. In a few moments, I'm gonna give you an opportunity to make a public stand for Christ. Jesus said, if you will confess or acknowledge me before people, I will acknowledge you before the Father and the angels in heaven. But if you deny me before people, I'll deny you before the Father and the angels. So by coming forward, you're making that public stand. You're saying, I don't care who sees. I want this relationship with God. And lastly, you must do it now. Now. You say, well, maybe next Sunday. No, not next Sunday. Maybe tomorrow, no, not tomorrow. You may never have another moment like you have right here, right now, in the Extra Mile Arena. This is your moment to come to Christ. Don't miss it. Jesus is passing by, he's here. He's ready to forgive you, but you must call out to him. The Bible says whoever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. But some of us, Some of us are too proud to call on the name of the Lord. We don't think we need to be saved. You met my son Jonathan earlier when he was a little guy 
I took him out in the water. I was helping him catch some waves. And uh, I lost my footing and I was caught in a riptide. The irony is I wasn't that far from the shore, but I couldn't get my feet on the bottom of there of the ocean. And so I'm getting pulled. And, and I'm trying to keep him above water. And there's a lifeguard. She was a lady sitting there watching us. And she starts running toward us with her flotation device. And I'm thinking, I don't want to be saved this close to shore. I was embarrassed. And she's swimming out to me and I finally got my footing. I said, I'm okay, thank you though. That's how a lot of us are. Oh, I don't want to call out to God. That's a sign of weakness. Christianity is a crutch. Oh listen, Christianity is not a crutch. It's a whole hospital and you need it. <laughs> He'll save you. He'll forgive you. This can be the night that you change your eternal address from hell to heaven. He's just a prayer away. In a moment we're going to pray. And then I'm going to invite you to put your faith in Jesus. I'm going to invite you to have him forgive you of your sin. I'm going to invite you to call out to the Lord. And he'll hear this prayer. And he'll answer this prayer. And this would be the moment your life changes. Let's all pray. Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit will now move in this place and in the hearts of those that are watching all over the world. And if they don't know you yet, I pray they'll see their need for you and that they will come to you and believe in you and receive the forgiveness only you can give. We ask all of this now in Jesus' name. Amen. Listen very carefully. If you want your sin forgiven, if you want to know that when you die you will go to heaven, if you want to fill the hole in your heart, if you want to find the meaning and purpose of life, if you're ready to say yes to Jesus Christ wherever you are, I want you to get up out of your seat and make your way down to the floor. And when you get here, we're going to have a prayer with you. We're going to give you a new believer's Bible. But I want you to get up now, on the very top level, get up out of your seat, make your way down those aisles, and come down to this floor, and we'll pray together. Listen to this. Everybody needs Jesus. You're not too young to come to Jesus. You might just be a kid. Last night a 10-year-old boy came forward. God touched his little heart. And I met him in the back room. We had a few moments together. You could be 10 or eight or seven or younger, but you realize you need Jesus, you come on down. But you're not too old to come to Jesus. We saw that video earlier about that older gentleman who came to Christ in the later years of his life. You see, it's too late for me, Greg. I can't change. Listen, Christ can change you. You come. You're not too good to come to Christ. You say, well, I go to church. I'm a religious person. Religion won't save you. You need Jesus. You're not good enough to get to heaven. But you're not too bad either. You say, I've done things that are so horrible, I'm so ashamed of, God would never forgive me. He will. You come to him. Jesus says, come to me, all of you who are laboring and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Get up out of your seat. Step into that aisle. Come down to this floor. Come with your sins. Come with your problems. Come with your addictions. Don't think, oh, I'll clean my life up and come to Christ. No, come to Christ. He'll clean your life up. You just come now. And I'm going to ask everybody out there to not talk. Don't talk. Shh. Don't talk. I want you to pray. I want you to pray for the person in front of you. Pray for the person behind you. Pray for the person on your right or left who may not know Jesus yet and they're grappling with this decision. Pray that they come to Christ now so you get up and come and we'll wait till you're all here. Come as the band sings. If you find your heart restless and searching for more, His love will meet you in. If you feel your world spinning out of control, His peace will meet you there. There's only one who holds the answer. There's only one name alone. And have you met my Jesus? 
There's still time for you. You can still come. I remember when I was on my high school campus, I mentioned this a few moments ago. When that invitation was given to come to Jesus, I was one of the last ones to walk forward. And you might be one of the last ones, but hey, better late than never, right? You can still come. Your life will change. You might say, well, show me and I'll believe. Jesus effectively says, believe and I'll show you. You come with your questions, you come with your doubts. Christ will change you tonight. He'll come into your life and forgive you of all of your sin and give you a fresh start. Imagine that, a fresh start. I love it when it rains. Because even people that don't wash their cars get their cars clean. Everything's so nice. Maybe a rainbow will come out. That's what can happen to you. All of your sins forgiven all of your sins forgotten. <laughs> but you must call out to the name of the Lord. So anybody else, you, you come now as the group sings. And then we're going to pray together. And I will Some of, you, some of you are in the aisles and you can't come down. That's because we want to do everything safely with room for everybody. So if you're in an aisle, just stand there. And we're going to come to you with the Bible. Make sure that everybody here is followed up on. So if you're in an aisle, just hang on. God bless all of you standing there. And the group's going to sing this chorus one more time. And then we're all going to pray together. And I will that are watching on television or online right now. 
you can accept Christ into your life. There's a phone number on the screen that you can call, and there's a little box that you can click indicating that you're asking your asking Christ to come into your life, and you can believe in Jesus just like all the folks here in this arena are doing right now. All right, now all of you that are here to make this commitment to Christ, some of you are in the aisles, just hold your position and we're gonna come to you. Don't go back to your seats yet. I'm gonna lead you in a prayer, all of you on the floor. I want you to pray this prayer out loud after me. This is where you're asking Jesus to come into your life to be your Savior and Lord. Mean it from your heart and God will hear and answer. So again, as I pray, Pray this out loud after me, okay? Let's bow our heads. Pray this now. Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner, but I know that you're the Savior who died on the cross for my sin and rose again from the dead. Jesus, I choose to follow you from this night forward as my Savior and Lord as my God and my friend. Thank you for hearing this prayer and answering this prayer. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. God bless each one of you. God bless you. God bless you.